I don't want to preach this sermon. How many of you think that means I shouldn't preach it? That's not the way it works. So, here goes. On January 5th, 2009, remember that year? Remember 2008, financial stuff that went on? Well, on January 5th, just after the new year 2009, the German billionaire Adolf Merkel, who was one of the richest men in the world, committed suicide. Seems that the international financial crisis put him over the edge. Merkel, age 74, allowed himself to be hit by a train. His family said the economic, cri- economic crisis had broken him. What had the crisis meant for him? In 2007, Merkel was worth 12.8 billion U.S. dollars, according to Forbes. By December 2008, he was worth only 9.2 billion dollars, a loss of 3.6 billion. Merkel slipped from being the 44th richest person in the world to the 96th richest person in the world. Apparently, he could not live with the loss. Today, we will continue our series that I've called Put Up or Shut Up, a verse-by-verse study through the book of James. As we come to verse 9 of the first chapter, we arrive at a topic that is a major theme throughout the book. I'm calling this theme Wealthy Warnings. You may or may not have known that the book of James is full of stern warnings about wealth. Maybe some of you are thinking to yourselves, whew, thank goodness. I can sit this one out. It's time for somebody else to be convicted because I am definitely not wealthy. Hmm. Let's think about that. According to the United States Census Bureau, the average American income per person in 2012 was estimated at $28,000. Frankly, that's less than the majority of people in this room uh, will earn this year. And yet that average income is more than 400% higher than the average income of the world as a whole. But that's still not an accurate picture of our wealth because the world income average includes the United States and the other richest countries of the world. Let's try another angle. When compared to the 56% of the world's population considered to be poor, our average income in the United States is somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000% higher. That's right, the average American, average American, earns up to 100 times more per year than the average individual from over half of the rest of the world. Granted, I understand that our cost of living is higher as well, but rest assured that the poorer 56% of the world never even thought about buying a single hair care product, ever. They never bought shaving cream, it's one of my savings right now. They never even bought one lawn chair. They never subscribed to a single magazine. And rather than standing on the street corner asking for cash like maybe some poor person here, most of the poor in the rest of the world would prefer a loaf of bread. For the majority of the rest of the world, the very thought of spending $5 on a coffee drink even once would be similar to me or you going out and buying a yacht. <clears throat> they aren't too worried about gas prices because most of them don't even know anyone who owns a car. We think we're being frugal when our family spends $25 on a meal at Taco Bell, but that's a pretty good monthly income for most of them. My point is that virtually every person in this room is wealthy compared to the rest of the majority of the world, and I'm not trying to make anyone feel guilty for the blessings we have, not at all. That would serve no purpose. I simply want us all to realize that even the average American is insanely wealthy in relation to most of the world. That means you don't get to set this one out, even if you feel like you're not a wealthy person. As we talk about warnings to the wealthy, don't think about someone who you may perceive as wealthy. If you have a vehicle, a place to live, plenty of clothes, and plenty of food, you are among the wealthiest people on planet Earth. Some of the rest of you may be still hanging back on the first thought you had when you picked up a program today and saw the listening guide or when I first began to speak, especially if you're a guest, every time I ever show up at church. 
like all the church ever talks about. Every time I ever show up at church, it's about money. Well, might as well get used to it because I preach the Bible, and the Bible has tons to say about money. Since I mostly preach straight through Scripture, just walking through the book of James here, there's no way for me to avoid the topic of money. Jesus himself talked more about money than any other single topic. And remember that James taught a lot like Jesus, having grown up in the same household. We've already seen how James constantly echoes the teachings of Christ. And since Jesus talked more about money than anything else, it stands to reason James would talk about it as well. We will be looking at three different sections of Scripture from the short book of James this morning. As we follow along each week, <clears throat> occasionally we will come to a verse or verses that address a topic which is also revisited again later in the book. When that happens, I will grab those later passages ahead of time and discuss them along with the passage for the day. It's either that or we can have three different messages in this series dealing with hard sayings about money. No? All right then. I'll just handle all three passages today and you can be glad it's over. So today we're looking at verses 9 through 11 from our bookmark in chapter 1. But then we're also looking ahead to chapter 2 verses 1 through 9 and chapter 5 verses 1 through 6. In each of these passages I see a different warning in relation to wealth. The first warning is this, wealth is a poor measure of self-worth. Wealth is a poor measure of self-worth. This is what I get from chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. Let's read it together. The brother <clears throat> in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed in the same way. The rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. This warning has to do with how we think of ourselves. Wealth really is a poor measure of self-worth. James tells us one of the reasons. Wealth is fleeting. It's temporary and you can't count on it. Therefore, if you're wealthy, and remember in some ways we all are, you should avoid the temptation to place any of your self worth in that wealth. You should find your purpose and significance in something other than what you have, whether that be stuff or position or accomplishment or education or anything else in which you might have gained wealth. Don't count those things. Don't count those things when you add up your self-worth. Why? Because everything that you have earned and even your ability to earn more of it could be gone or irrelevant tomorrow. And then how will you value yourself? Beyond that, we already know that at the end of life, it will all be gone. Earthly wealth of all types, types will be meaningless in the end. And as James says, it will fade away even while you're going about your business. If you find your self-worth in what you have, or the position or skill or mental prowess that allows you to have it, you are building your life on a foundation that you already know will eventually be washed away. And quite possibly sooner than later, James tells us that's not a good idea. Meanwhile, if you don't feel wealthy, even if you feel like a failure in terms of the way the world defines success, if you're often out of work, barely able to pay the bills, and sometimes not, that's when it's easier to find comfort in your high position before the Lord. Wait, what? I thought I was supposed to look down on people like that. Quite the opposite. What does the Bible say here? Remember, this is written to believers, and James says, the brother... The brother or sister, in humble circumstances, ought to take pride in his high position. James is saying, if you're a Christian, you know, a brother, an adopted son or daughter of God, an heir and recipient of the inheritance of Christ, one who's promised a mansion with Jesus forever, then thank God for the areas where you, felt, areas where you feel poor, because your poverty can help you remember what really matters. Your poverty on earth can keep you humble enough so that the only pride you can find is in the high position you hold before God as one of His precious children. By the way, folks, all pride is not bad. Not all pride is bad. If you're proud because you're a child of God through faith in Christ, that's fantastic. 
However, if you're more proud of what you've acquired or accomplished on earth than who you are in Christ, that's a problem. And isn't it obvious that this would tend to be a bigger problem for those who have a lot? Well, let's get real. Don't just think hypothetically about how other people should be. Where do you find your sense of self-worth? Do some inventory. Honestly, what makes you feel like a valuable person? What do you take pride in? What makes you think your life matters? Do you find your worth in your achievements, your successes, your position, your accumulations, your accomplishments, your projects, your properties, your bank accounts, your stuff? Friends, as followers of Christ, those things are to be used as tools, not displayed as trophies or hoarded as security blankets. If you claim to follow Jesus, then listen up right now. Your wealth is meant to be a tool, not a trophy. If you're a brother or sister, you know the Lord Jesus. You know, some of you are here today to hear that sentence. Your wealth is meant to be a tool, not a trophy. For some of you, your house is your wealth. Your cars or other stuff may be your wealth. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that some people do have actual dollars in the bank. And so that may be your wealth. But remember, wealth does not necessarily mean gold bars in a vault, as that certainly wasn't the case for, for the original audience of the book of James here. Your wealth is what you have, maybe prop property or houses or clothes or stuff, or maybe it's even something like a wealth of education. And I'm telling you that whatever your wealth is, it's not meant to be a trophy but rather a tool surrendered to God and His plans. Does anyone remember the verse before this one? The last verse we covered a week ago, James told us not to be dipsychos, remember? That's the actual Greek word that means double-minded, dipsychos, love it. Don't be double-minded, James tells us. And then he writes right after that, let the brother in humble circumstances take pride in his high position. See, if you're a believer, a follower of Christ, and you're taking pride in something other than the high position before God that you have through the sacrifice of Jesus, then you are double-minded. If you take pride in your wealth or find your self-worth to some degree in what you have accumulated, then you're double-minded. If your worth is in your wealth, achievements, position, then the core of who you are is straddling the fence. And you, my friend, are a dipsychos person. Notice something else. Even if you're not wealthy, in your own estimation, you can still make the mistake of seeking your identity in wealth. You can actually find identity in the wealth that you're working towards or in the wealth that you dream about, the wealth that you actually believe will complete your life. I've known a lot of people like that. In fact, I've known a lot more people like that than I've known actually wealthy people in that sense of wealth. If this is you, then you probably don't feel very good about yourself right now because you don't have it yet, what you're dreaming of or working towards. You may never feel good about yourself in this life because your reality is that you may never acquire your definition of wealth. You may never get there. You know, that, that might not be what you read in, in the books that you read. They try to motivate you in the, the popular motivational books about how to get rich. They don't, they're not going to tell you it may never happen, but it's the truth. You may never become wealthy. You may never have as much as Fred or Sally or Bob Proctor or whoever. People who are getting rich by getting you to buy their books and join their programs. A newsflash, even if you do get rich, you will absolutely be disappointed if that's what you made your life about, extremely disappointed, maybe even to the point of suicide. My suggestion, get over it now. Wealthy. Otherwise, especially in today's economic system, you're prone to pile on more and more debt trying to feel wealthy. I'll never forget that commercial. Remember that commercial a few years ago, the guy's driving his John Deere and he got the house and the pool and everything, and, 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 and he, he's like, Look at all this stuff. How do I do it all? I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. <laughs> I don't remember the whole commercial, but yeah, it's like I, I don't really own any of this. It owns me.
You think you'll feel better. You have a great career, get that business off the ground, and when you can really see some progress in your effort to build that wealthy lifestyle. But the truth is that you're chasing a shadow and the sun is going down. Don't spend the next 20 years figuring this out. Wealth is a poor measure of self-worth. Where should we find our self-worth? James tells us to find it in the fact that God has already given us a high position in Christ. How high is this position? What is this position that rich and poor Christians are supposed to take pride in? Are we talking like CEO level position in Christ? Are we talking owner of a major corporation type wealth in our position before God? Oh, it's way better than that. In fact, we're talking about royalty here. Heavenly royalty. <clears throat> the Bible says, 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to, to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. The book called Revelation in the Bible tells us we will reign with Christ as members of His royal court. Honored royalty in his eternal kingdom. Philippians 3.20 tells us we're citizens of heaven, even now. Holding a citizenship <clears throat> that is the highest conceivable honor we could hold. The Bible tells us that as Christ followers, we now belong to the same kingdom as the angels. Paul goes so far as to say that we will be placed over the angels in the heavenly hierarchy. As those who are saved by grace through faith in Christ, we're now part of the family of God. Are you kidding me? Along with Jesus, with those great men and women of the faith who've gone before us, we're members of the royal family of heaven, inheritors of the eternal riches of Christ. I'm not even done. As a believer, you've been given immortality. You are now immortal. Your soul will never die or experience the death of separation from God in hell. Although these marred bodies will expire, they'll res be resurrected new and imperishable at the return of Christ. We have inherited eternal life with God. Eternal life with God. Meanwhile, Ephesians 1.14 tells us that the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, actually lives inside of, of us. <clears throat> given to us as a deposit and a seal, guaranteeing all of these things are ours and will be ours in Christ as a container of the Holy Spirit. You are priceless. Because of grace through faith in Jesus, you are worth more than anything this earth has to offer. Than this whole earth. Well, that's what I mean when you say, what if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? How about if your soul is made alive by God? How about if your soul gets to live forever with God? The God of the universe has taken up residence inside of the believer. Do you understand that? The God of the universe lives in you. See, that's the place to find your self-worth. Are you kidding me? God lives in me? The Holy Spirit lives in me. That's a whole lot more healthy and secure place to find your self-worth than how much disintegrating stuff you can fit into your garage. You want to be somebody? I'll be honest. So do I. I want to be somebody. I want to make a difference. I want to be somebody. But you know what? Having a prestigious career or a Ferrari and a mansion on the beach, that won't make you jack squat. On the other hand, being forgiven, made holy, paid for, freed up, and dwelt, empowered, immortalized, eternalized, revitalized, revived, redeemed, gifted with the priceless inheritance of Christ makes you somebody very, very special. Can I have an amen? Do you understand who you are? Or somebody put that in a Super Bowl commercial. To sum this passage up, the poor Christian brother needs to be reminded that his position in Christ is exalted, regardless of how lowly he may feel on earth. Conversely, the wealthy Christian brother needs to be reminded that his wealth is fleeting and his responsibility is to use what he's been given to do the will of God on earth. Either way, remember this, wealth is a poor measure of self-worth.
Secondly, wealth is a poor measure of others' worth. Wealth is a poor measure of others' worth. This warning pertains to how we think about other people. <clears throat> For this section, we're looking at the first nine verses of James chapter 2. He writes, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by, by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Now, again, remember the original audience. James is not talking to rich people here. We can extrapolate some things as relatively rich people ourselves, but James is actually writing to poor Christians who have been dispersed. Remember, they're running for their lives. And he's telling them how they should treat others who are poor. He's take, talking to these pockets of Christians meeting as churches about how they relate to the different people that they might be able to reach for Christ. He's telling them not to think more highly of a wealthier guest than a poorer guest. Obviously, this no longer is relevant in the church today. We're never guilty of, of what James is talking about here. That's called sarcasm. Let's be honest instead. We still tend to sum people up based on their socioeconomic position. You don't want to say amen to that, but you know it. Be real. The biggest problem with stereotypes is that they are, by definition, surface level. Stereotypes often keep us from getting beyond the superficial. When we think of a person as poor or rich, successful or not so successful, or even just sort of one class or another, we never get down to what really matters about that person, their soul. We never get down to their story or their heart. Contrary to the way most people naturally think, <clears throat> there might be more to value about a poor person's soul than someone else who's brimming with worldly success. Did you read the scripture that we just read? Let's, let's look at this. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes... People who are poor in worldly things are richest in spiritual things because that's all they have. Not always true, of course, but what's our tendency? Our tendency is to think rich, successful people are better. And, of course, it's possible to err to the side of reverse discrimination, but the point is this. Wealth is a terrible measure of the value of other people. Notice once again that James echoes the teachings of Christ. Look at the underlined verse, verses in your notes. At the end, James even repeats that teaching of Christ similar to the golden rule, calling it the royal law. But even before that, in verse 5, he writes, Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be what? Rich in faith. And to what? Inherit the kingdom, he promised, those who love him. What particular teaching of Christ is James referring to here well let's come straight out of the beatitudes uh, the, the preceding the opening to the sermon on the mount remember jesus said blessed are the poor in spirit by the way i think it's in luke where he doesn't add the in spirit it just says poor but blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven exactly what james is referring back to actually jesus made this type of point quite a few times one of those times he quoted isaiah saying the spirit of the lord is upon me for he has appointed me to preach good news to who the poor another time jesus actually indicated it's almost impossible for the rich to receive his message although we know that a few who were rich did become his followers people like nicodemus and matthew but the fact remains that most of his disciples were very poor and Jesus actually said it's harder for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to come into heaven. Later adding, nevertheless, all things are possible with God. So why did Jesus and James seem to favor the poor? And make no mistake, they did. They absolutely did. We need to be honest about that. Their words favored the poor. But why? Why this emphasis on the poor just short of the exclusion of the rich? 
Why are the poor so blessed according to Jesus? Why is the kingdom of heaven theirs? Why, according to James, has God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom? Well, folks, for the answer to that, we're going to need to look at a teaching from the Apostle Paul. Isn't it interesting how many times <clears throat> we go to Paul for answers? That's because he's the great explainer, particularly of previously written scripture. <clears throat> And on this topic, he said this, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Sometimes in these latter days, teachers have been so interested in pointing out what these verses do not say that they have missed the obvious. The obvious truth is that wealth is dangerous. Look at the words I've underlined. Temptation, trap, foolish, harmful, ruin, destruction, evil, wandered, pierced, and griefs. Hear me right now. Wealth is dangerous and someone wants to point out oh yes but that's the love of money pastor mark it's the love of money right and that absolves you from needing to hear this exactly how are you telling me you don't ever struggle with the love of money for the things that that money can buy for the power that it gives if so you're either not being honest with yourself or you're better at this than most everyone and and the more you have see the more danger you face because the more you have the harder it is not to love it and I mean like my precious kind of love okay the truth is it's awfully hard to have wealth and not want more of it we want to judge we wanted to judge that billionaire I talked about in the beginning but we do the same thing on a smaller scale and there's no difference in principle what if you lost 30% of your income and 30% of all that you have? Like if you had a 30% less nice house, 30% less nice cars, less of everything, you'd probably have some depression. We here today likely all struggle with the love of money to some degree because we are all wealthy in many ways. Listen, we need to get it through our heads that having lots of stuff and or lots of money is absolutely a dangerous thing for a Christian. It's dangerous. Now, I'm not saying that it's morally wrong to have wealth. I absolutely did, not, absolutely did not say that. But what I am saying is that wealth is dangerous. Hear me on that, or at least hear James, the brother of Jesus. Beware. Not saying you need to avoid wealth, not saying you need to take a vow of poverty, but I am saying that your eyes must be open to the fact that wealth can be a treacherous thing. Handle with care. Scripture's wealth warnings are found throughout both the Old and the New Testaments. It's everywhere in the Bible, and some of them are pretty doggone scary. Listen, those who would follow Christ in this world should have a healthy fear of riches. And they certainly should not mostly be driven by efforts to get rich. I had a conversation this week with someone who was, I mean, it wasn't even like it was sort of kind of hidden or anything. It was like, this is what my life is about. I read a book every day. Every day I read this book that tells me how to be rich. I was told 20 years ago by my mentor, if I would read this book every day, I would be rich. And I'm pretty rich now, and I read it every day. I wanted to say, and I didn't. It was not the right setting. There's only one book I read every day, and it's not called How to Be Rich. That was the title of the book. That is not the life of a Christian on this earth. No way. You can't be driven by getting rich. It can't be what drives you. Now, I also realize there are several biblical role models who were blessed by God with wealth. So, again, I'm not saying it's impossible to follow God and be rich, but the fact is that in Scripture, more often than not, the poor are praised, and the wealthy are lambasted often, <laughs> warned at least, as oppressors and idolaters. There's a reason for that as we'll see more clearly going forward. Wealth has a tendency to breed a feeling of self-sufficiency which is not conducive to receiving a Savior, nor does it help us continue to submit to Him through life. Usually those who are rich in stuff are not so much poor in spirit. You see, only beggars beg. 
Humility is required in order to receive Christ, and humility is required in order to follow Him. Because of the dangers of wealth, poor people often have a shorter distance, a shorter journey to arrive at the humility required for following Jesus. Maybe that's why evangelism seems to have stalled out in America while it's thriving in places like China and Cuba. Jesus said, He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Why did He say that? Why was it true? Maybe because need drives us toward God. Poor people often listen better and are more receptive to the gospel. I've been to Nicaragua many times, led scores of people to Christ there. Second poorest country in this hemisphere. By the way, we're going to take a mission trip there, I think, in August. Start saving if you're interested. We'll talk more about it later. So partly for this reason, James reminds the early believers that there's no place in the church for showing favoritism to the rich. In fact, we should make sure we give honor to the poor in the church because they don't, they don't get honor anywhere else. We need to be different. And because our tendency is to do otherwise. But the bottom line is that we are all equally destitute and desperate for God in terms of our own merit. And yet as believers, we're also equally loved by God. We stand on common ground in the church like no other place in the world. And I do realize somebody can feel like James is discriminating against rich people, but that's, this is inspired scripture, so that would be like saying God is discriminating against rich people. Rather, he's speaking against the natural fleshly tendency of people to place others in higher category levels of importance based on what they have, what they do, who they know, or what they know. God doesn't do that, and neither should his church. He even goes and says, hey, these are the people who are oppressing you. You know, try to make his point a little more. Their point, James and Jesus, is that worldly riches or the lack thereof means nothing in terms of a person's worth. And more specifically, wealth should add nothing to a person's standing in the church. We are all on equal footing in that regard. There must be no favoritism in the way we treat each other at Go Church. Don't think we don't need to hear this. You better, watch, you better think about it some more. I know I, I know I know I need to. Now, the third wealth warning <clears throat> that we find in the book of James may even be harder to hear. Wealth can lead to greed and corruption. Wealth can lead to greed and corruption. The third warning speaks to how we think about life. So the first warning helps us think better about ourselves. The second warning helps us think better about others. This last warning will help us think better about life. Let's read the scripture from whence this warning comes. James chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Fasten your seatbelts. Now listen, you rich people. Yes. <laughs> Weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who moved your field, mowed your fields are crying out against you. So here's some, here's some corruption. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You yourselves, are you here, have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence? You've fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. Some of you thought I was being too hard on the wealthy earlier. What do you, what do you think now? I didn't write the Bible. Now, having said that, is James talking to all rich people here? No. The context shows clearly he is not, but he is addressing tendencies that all wealthy people must guard against. That's why this is a warning. And remember, in many ways, all of us in this room are rich. I'll ask you again to stop thinking about somebody else you know and realize this is probably for you. The truth of the matter is that wealth tends to lead to greed and corruption. Now, did I say all wealthy people are greedy and corrupt? No not. Some of the most amazing believers I've ever known are people of means. What I'm, also, what I'm saying is that as, the, as a Bible-believing Christian who happens to live in America, 
and who therefore either has wealth or has the opportunity for wealth, you'd be very foolish to ignore the many warnings of Scripture against the potential evils of wealth. Meanwhile, like it or not, there are many Scriptures that speak of the benefits, benefits of being poor as it comes to character development. There are special blessings that come with being poor. There's hardships of poverty are spoken as benefits in Scripture, and they can, they can contribute to personal, spiritual, emotional growth. Like it or not, the Bible tends to lift up the poor and warn the rich. In America especially, we're foolish Christians if we do not take heed. Interestingly, commentators often liken the book of James to Old Testament wisdom literature, such as the book of Proverbs. James has many words to the wise, like Proverbs. James is a collection of life principles, sometimes without a whole lot of flow from one thought to the next, as we'll see. In fact, Proverbs gives similar wealth warnings to those we've been studying in James. For instance, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. <clears throat> Cast but a glance at riches, and they're gone. And they'll surely sprout wings and fly off the sky, off to the sky like an eagle. One man pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. How do I make sure that my wealth doesn't lead me to injustice? How do I make sure I have not simply hoarded wealth in the last days, as James says? How do I avoid spending my life in pursuit of a fleeting treasure? And most importantly, if I'm indeed wealthy compared to most of the world, how do I avoid greed and corruption? The answer to that question, how do I avoid greed and corruption? The answer is generosity. The ultimate answer to these, all of these wealthy warnings is found in giving generously. The answer is in regularly choosing to let go. My precious. To give away significant portions of wealth and the more we're given the more important it is we continue to give even more it's an uphill battle the more you have the harder it is to give it away but the bible knows no other methodology for guarding against wealth's tendencies toward greed and corruption besides generosity the bible says the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put god first in your lives See, it isn't so much that God wants to have your money. He just doesn't want your money to have you. The purpose of tithing is to put God first in your life. It's true for people of all income levels, but it's perhaps even more important for the rich. Why? Because wealth is dangerous, and it can lead to greed and corruption. But faithfulness and giving can guard your heart against these things. I mentioned that Jesus taught more about money than anything else. Let's look at one of those teachings from Luke 12. Starting with verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? <clears throat> then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. <clears throat> and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. This guy had more and more stuff, so he found more and more ways to store it. He was feeling pretty pumped about it, feeling self-worth and abundance of his possessions, but he died rich in the possessions that would no longer matter and poor toward the God he was about to face. What is the implied solution? The solution is found in what it means to be rich toward God. What does it mean to be rich toward God? Again, Paul is the explainer. As it relates to the church, Paul tells young Pastor Timothy, talking about what to do about the people, who, people of means in his congregation. They're at Ephesus. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves. Wow. 
as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I could continue to quote verse after verse that would admonish us toward generosity, folks. But I don't want to spend any more time making any kind of case for giving today. What I want to do is offer you application. I want to offer you a remedy, an answer to the challenge of avoiding greed and corruption in this materialistic world. You can take this remedy or you can leave it. But I'm going to issue a very real challenge toward generosity this morning. If you'd have known what you were in for, many of you would have stayed home today. I've been telling you James is for real. What's the title of this series again? Oh, that's what you meant? (laughs) Put up or shut up. James is about application. It's all about where the rubber hits the road with James. Enough of this theology stuff. Live it. So here we go. The Bible says I'm called to be the spiritual leader of this church. Did you know that? Acts 20, 28. The Holy Spirit puts a pastor in place, the Bible says. So I'm going to have the audacity to lead, even though it may offend some people. It always does. And so I hereby designate February 2020 as Tithe Experiment Month (laughs) at Go Church. Tithe Experiment Month. Now listen, if you're new and you haven't decided that this is your church, obviously you can ignore this. But you might as well know that if you do choose this church, stuff like this is going to happen down the road. But for now, for you, you know, you're just kicking the tires. That's okay. It's not for you, but... If this is your church, I have a challenge for you. And obviously I can't make you do anything. I wouldn't want to try to make you do anything. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But here's my challenge. I challenge every single person who calls this church home to actually tithe, if you don't, if you don't already, for one month. Just one month. To actually tithe. That's going to be a huge step for some of you. But remember, this is just a short-term experiment. Additionally, if you're already a tither, I'm not letting you all the way off the hook so I'm challenging you for this month only to tithe on your tithe. In other words, give 10% more on your 10%. In other words, give one more percent, give 11% for the month of February just to do something, increase. Now, I'm not doing this because I think it will make that big of a huge difference in our, in our monthly income this month. Um, I'm doing this because I think it will help people take a step in the right direction. Uh, The word tithe means tenth. I did a message on that not long ago. Some of you are like, we know, you just talked about this. (laughs) But for those of you who are new to this, I'm talking about giving 10% of your income for the month of February. Income includes salary and any other way you make financial gains, such as selling property or otherwise. So after this month, you feel free to go back to whatever you normally give, and that will be between you and God. I'm just challenging you to decide to make a commitment to do this for one month. Just to put God first. Let the other bills figure it out just for one month. Put God first. Or don't. It's totally up to you. Now, why is this an experiment? It's an experiment because you're going to see what God will do when you put Him first in this way. When we get done with this, I'm going to want to hear your stories. I've heard a lot of stories on this kind of thing. Because I know from experience and I know from Scripture that God is going to come through. The Bible says this. I didn't make it up. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you'll not have room enough for it. Test me in this, says God. That's an invitation to experiment, folks. And by the way, since the Lord Almighty said this, far be it for me to say it no longer applies. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Some other preacher says this Old Testament doesn't apply. First of all, he's not mainstream. Second of all, I guess you can make him your pastor if you want. But this pastor believes God's word in the Old Testament is still a better standard than whatever you might come up with on your own, out of your own head. So I look forward to what we can do together. Again, February 2020, Tithe Experiment Month at Go Church. I'm not going to put that on Facebook. But you were here and you heard it. Somebody may ask why. I'm asking why not. Let's get real. Let's do this thing. James is for real. As I close, remember 
the three wealth warnings from James, the earthly brother of Jesus, leader of the Jerusalem church. Wealth is a poor measure of self-worth. Wealth is a poor measure of others' worth. Wealth can lead to greed and corruption. These are warnings. Take heed. On the positive side, remember that in the hands of a believer, wealth is a tool, not a trophy. And generosity is the key to avoiding the potential pitfalls of wealth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, this message. Very much for those who have said, I want to be a follower of Jesus. This is not for the world. It's not for those who are still unsure. For people who have said, I'm committing my life to Christ. And so right now in this moment in prayer, I also want to remember those who in the room maybe who have not made that decision. Maybe they've been told in the past that it's just really just kind of say something or pray something and it doesn't really change anything in your life and you can get your ticket to heaven. I hope that as we preach the book of James that some of that false information falls apart and some people realize there's more to it. Faith is what saves us putting our trust and our faith in Christ and what he did on the cross. But James gives us a picture of what happens after that. And it's a whole life devoted to Jesus, a whole life about following Christ. And those who don't follow Christ are not his followers. So Lord, help us do a lot of self-checking and inventory. Many of us are going to need to recommit in some areas. Others may need to realize Whatever they thought they had done wasn't really the kind of faith needed for salvation and for life change to occur. Only you can speak to our hearts. Only you can help us know which is it. But right now I pray for those who've never really committed to Christ, never put on the parachute and jumped out of the plane, said, I'm putting it all, all my chips on the cross, <laughs> that I'm just going to count on what Jesus did for salvation and follow him with my life. All of us could do better. All of us can be convicted. Some of us need to make that initial step. For those that need to make that initial step, Lord, I pray today might be the day. And that they might let us know so we can help them understand better and move forward with the next steps. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your word. Change our hearts. Change our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen.